This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This I recall to my mind, therefore, have I hope it is of the Lord's mercy. Yeah. We have not been concerned with your compassion, fail it not. Your mercies are new every morning, and great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul, therefore have I hope in you. Father in heaven, we invite your Holy Spirit's presence in our midst today. We come to worship you in the beauty of holiness. We come to worship you in spirit and in truth. As we gather here today, Lord God, in person, on Zoom, YouTube Live, we're asking that each and every person will experience the power and the presence of the Lord. So, Rob, we ask for you today to show up. We ask for you to show out. We ask for you to show your people. Show yourself strong among the people today. We thank you. Thank you. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Thank you. 
Welcome to the Tucson Sharing Worship Experience. We're happy to have you here with us. We want to welcome all of you who are watching us on YouTube Live. We want to also welcome our Facebook family. We're grateful that you're joining us today. Say, there is no substitute for in person worship. And we this week. So we want to welcome everyone that is here visiting with us here today. Um, there are some guests that I want to recognize, a couple of first time guests that are here with us today. So I want to start off with asking Sister Troutman if she will please stand. For those of you who don't know, Sister Troutman is Isaac's mom. My wife and I met there back in 2003 when we went uh, to Huntsville to attend Oakwood and we had church when we were and that's when we were in the was a little boy. It's a little boy at that time. And now the Lord has grown him up into a grown man and we're happy that his mom is here today. Today is a very special day um, for Isaac and his mom as immediately after the service today, Isaac will be rebaptized in the name of the Lord. Amen. And amen. So we praise God. We praise God for them. And I want to welcome some other special guests who are visiting us for the very first time. But they've already told me it won't be their last time. And I want to ask if Dr. and Mrs. Mr. Roast, please stand. Roast. They are visiting us from the great state of Texas, but they are planning to relocate here to Tucson. And I asked them, how did they find out about us? And Dr. Worst said her sister told her, you need to go and check out the Tucson Sharon Church. She is also relocating. Dr. Worst, where is she relocating from? Also from Texas. So praise the Lord. So we've got some folks coming from Texas right here to Tucson. And I would just say it's not this humid normally. It's a whole lot dry. So uh, this is unusual. But we are grateful for you visiting today. And we're looking forward to seeing you more often. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. Elder Shoki has promised we worked hard this week so that everybody's comfortable, making sure that your conditioning was working properly. I don't know what they did while I was gone, because it was working when I left, but we made sure it would be working today. I want to thank Brother Jerry White, who's not able to be here today. He had a slight injury, and he's dealing with some health issues. However, he made sure that the air conditioning will be working for us today. So I'm hoping you are comfortable, but I owe that to Brother White and his efforts. And so we praise the Lord for that. So we have a lot to do today, so we are not going to uh, labor this, but we want you to know today is a special day, a high Sabbath day, because we are preparing for a baptism today. So we're praying that the word of God will minister to you today, but also we are looking forward to the culmination at the end of the worship experience with our baptism. So we're going to ask for those of you to please stay back um, so that you can be a part of this and uh, those our viewers who are watching us online as well. So we're going to just move on in our program and we're going to be blessed uh, with a scripture reading brought to us this morning by Sister Connie Prince. Morning. I'm going to read this morning from Judges 6. Open your Bibles with me. I'm going to be reading verses 11 through 16. Judges 6, 11 through 16. Can you please stand? Thank you. And your human angel, the Lord, and set under an oak. Because of Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash, the Gibraltar. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O oh, my Lord, 
if the Lord be with us, why then is all of this befallen us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us, and saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O oh my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We have a few prayer requests to put before the church family in preparation for Sister Michelle, who will be interceding for us today. Please remember John Eames. He is now in Los Angeles, and we're still needing to pray for people find. We will need to uh, find permanent housing for jobs. So this will be in the prayer, John Eats. Also, we want to remember in prayer, um, Sister Diane Orion. We want to continue to remember her in prayer. She's still at Handmaker. And just to let you know, she is open to visitors. And so if you will remember her in prayer, uh, she would greatly appreciate that. We want to remember all of our seniors in prayer. Um, Brother Jose Cotton, Sister Jeanette Hubbard last Sunday celebrated her 80th birthday. And we had a wonderful time for those of us who were there for that. Remember, Sister Judy, remember, obviously, her Mother Margaret Rooms. Let's remember her in our prayers as well. So all of our seniors, our church members, and all, also our community at large, a lot is happening. I mean, you consider in Europe, hundreds of people missing from floods caused by torrential rains. Uh, we've had a building collapse in Florida. We've had an assassination in Haiti. It's just like the world is totally out of control. But we know who holds the world. And so God is still in control, even in the midst of all the chaos. And so we want to remember these things in prayer. Lastly, we want to remember Shreya. Shreya Baruch Marilla is on her way back to college in Kentucky. She wanted to be here today, but her uncle wanted to get some things squared away with her vehicle since she is driving cross country. So she was not able to be here today, but I told Shreya we would pray for her traveling mercies. She's returning to her senior year. I think she's attending Bellerin College in Kentucky in elementary education, and I think an emphasis also in special education. So this is her final semester that she's going back, then she'll do her teaching, and then she'll be finished. And so we want to pray for her success this academic year. So we just want to ask for you to remember those in prayer. And our, our, in particular, our prayer ministry team. Our prayer ministry team is very intentional and committed to praying and covering over all of us throughout the week. They pray Tuesday morning at six o'clock. They pray Thursday morning at six o'clock and they are praying over all of us. And I wanna thank God for their ministry. And if you ever want to participate in that, we'll make sure you have the information where you can join via teleconference. Um, beautiful thing that reading through the book, The Mighty Prevailing Prayer by Dr. Wesley Duell, and it's just been transforming their lives and they're praying over us. So just know that you're prayed over on Tuesday, six o'clock in the morning, Thursday, six o'clock in the morning. You say, Pastor, that might be too early for me. Well, we pray from Monday through Friday at 12 noon. We have a 12 noon prayer ministry team separate from the, 12, the prayer ministry team at six o'clock 
on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So if that's too early, you can join the 12 noon. We start at 12 and we pray with different people leading out. We're reading through the Gospel of Mark on Monday through Friday at 12 noon. So you can join us there. We're also praying for the entire church family. You say, Pastor, that may still be too early. Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Prime time. You can join us right now, still from the comfort of your home. You can pick up the phone and join us for a Wednesday night prayer meeting as well. So this is a place where prayer is want to be made. There are opportunities for you, whether you're early morning or you're not an early riser, seven o'clock Wednesday, you can call in and join us. We're concluding our series. Um, we're gonna be concluding by the end of July and at Wednesday night, <clears throat> seven o'clock, we're dealing with the question, why Abraham? Why Abraham? Why did God call Abraham? And we have looked at the weaknesses in Abraham's life. None of us would have picked Abraham to have a covenant with. No woman in her right mind would even pick Abraham to be her husband. But we are looking at why God chose Abraham. And so we're getting ready to come to a conclusion, but it's not too late because we're getting ready to get to the most important reason as to why God chose Abraham. So we encourage you to be a part of that. Sister Michelle, you will come and lead us in prayer. Happy Sabbath, church. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, before we ask you for anything, we want to give you thanks and praise. We want to thank you, Lord, for waking us up this morning in our right mind and bringing us here, taking us safely to another world, Lord. And we thank you for your holy Sabbath day when we can come together as a people to give you praise and worship that only you so richly deserve. So Lord, we have praise on our lips and thanksgiving in our hearts as we intercede on behalf of others. Lord, I pray for my church family in a special way, Lord. Guide us, guide us, guard us, and protect us in your love and in your perfect will, I pray. Lord, our Savior in a special way, those of us who are sick, but the chance of God, this is I am moving in here. This is a the rules, Brother John, and the numerous others, Lord, you know. I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know, but Lord, I ask for more intervention in each and every life within your perfect will and way. Lord, I pray for our first responders and last responders, for healthcare workers, of sick, those of us who are seeking employment, those of us who are homeless, Lord, I ask that you each of be like only you can, Lord, in every life that you seek to know. Every prayer, Lord, that goes up, I ask for your intervention and in your perfect will. Lord, I pray that you will continue to guide this ministry, Lord, or community service ministry or prayer ministry or renovation. Lord, you see your work needs to continue. And Lord, if you need to bring this renovation with Lord, Lord, I thank you. I praise you. I give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise, Lord. Only you so much to deserve. And that's, Lord, but not by any means, I lift up your man servant, Lord, the man of the hour, who is going to bring your word to your people. Use it like you do always, Lord. In Jesus' name, I pray. But I'm glad to be back in God's church, amen. <laughs> I'm so grateful to be back in the house of the Lord. I really am. We're driving down the highway this morning. 
Now just smile. Uh, I'm back. Oh, yes, we have so. But it's nothing like being among God. I'm waiting to be here among you this morning. Glory, hallelujah. What a wonderful God to serve. So it's, it's lovely time. It's only time when we all can contribute. And so as Christians, we give to our God because he is God. He is our creator, our redeemer, and sustainer. When we accept the, the, the worship of Christ, we acknowledge that he is the one who daily provides for us. When Jesus taught the disciples to pray, he reminded them that it is the Lord that provides our daily bread. Though we are to be concerned about meeting the various needs of God, church, the primary motives for giving are not based on the present need of his church. From the biblical perspective, our acceptable offerings are motivated by our desire to offer ourselves to God. We recognize God as Lord of our life. Therefore, our offering becomes an act of homage and submission to the one who redeemed us and is now our Lord. Often also demonstrates that we have faith in God's providential care. Our offering says that our relationship with our God is more important than things and that we trust him to provide for our needs. Amen? Amen. An acceptable offering is an embodiment of the worship of gratitude, thanksgiving, joy, and love. We all know that God doesn't need the money. In Council of Stewardship, it states the Lord does not need our offering. We cannot enrich by we cannot enrich him by our gifts, says the psalmist. All things come of thee, and of thy own have we given thee. Yet God permit us to show our appreciation of his mercy by self-sacrificing efforts to extend the same to others. This is the only way in which it is impossible for us to manifest our gratitude and love to God. He has provided no other. And finally, an acceptable offering, although spontaneous, is at the same time systematic. Systematic. God blesses us on a regular and continuous basis, and we should respond in a regular and systematic way. Thanks of God, let us begin to continue to give an offering, a regular and offering. Recognizing we give to our God because He is our God. Yeah. He is our Creator. And he is our Redeemer. He is our Sustainer. And there are several ways you can give. You can give through regular mail, and that's Tucson Sharing, SDA Church, PO Box 26566, Tucson, Arizona 85726. Attention to the Treasurer, Michael Wetzel. And then the online giving. That's Tucson Sharing, az.adventist.org, adventistchurch.org. Click on the online giving button. You will see different categories of giving. Remit your tithes and on the local check. Click, click, the, click the more often categories and additional categories will pop up. You can select the building fund. You can, you can select the local offer. And for the smartphone users, you can use your Adventist giving app. And choose Tucson Share with SDA Church and follow those instructions. And for us today, there's a box, there's a box right there in the back. Just drop you all in there. We thank you in advance. We want everybody who hears the sound of my voice to receive their blessing Amen. by giving to the kingdom of God. Amen. So give and receive your blessing. And let us pray. Father God, we thank you for being our God. We thank you for the love and the care of your mercy. And we give honor and love and praise for your name. So, Father, we bless those who can give today. We bless those who cannot give at this time. And may these resources go to continue to do your work, but you are soon coming for a life to you. So, we like ready to receive So, we ask these blessings in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Thank you, Al Hudson. We're now going to have a special musical selection and that will be brought to us by Isaac Troutman.
great is thy faithfulness. Turn again now. With the red hand held. Now changes nothing, conditions it fell not. As thou hast been, thou forever. Am, am I muted? Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. So, summer and winter, springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and sun. In the courses of join with all nature and the full wings to thy faithfulness, mercy and love. Is thy faithfulness? Great is thy faithfulness.
Amen. Amen. Thank you, Isaac, for blessing us. I didn't know you were going to hit that boat. Amen. That's a tough act to follow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for setting the page, setting the table for us to come to the word of God. Great is his faithfulness, is it not? Amen. If it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, where would I be? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Great, great is his faithfulness to us. Give me a little more. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're going to get right into the word. I want to thank Isaac for setting the stage for us. And now we're going to go right into the word of God for this morning. Let us pray. Father in heaven, let the words of my mouth, let the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength, my rock, and my redeemer. So speak, Lord, for your people who are listening. We ask this in Jesus' name of the saints of God. Say amen and amen. The story of Ray Blankenship is a profile in courage. Ray was preparing breakfast one day when he looked out of the window and he saw a little girl being swept away in a flooded draining ditch in Andover, Ohio. True story. Ray knew that downstream the ditch disappeared under the road and emptied into a huge channel. He knew the girl would be lost by that time. So Ray instinctively ran out the house and raced along the ditch so he could get in front of the little girl who was struggling to stay afloat. Once ahead of her, he dived into the churning waters. He went under the water and when he came up reaching, he was able to grab the little girl's arm. While they're in the raging water, he is holding on for her for dear life, but they are getting closer and closer to the huge channel that the ditch empties out into. Ray finally reaches and grabs hold of a rock that happened to be protruding from the bank. He held on desperately as the water seemed to be threatening to rip him and the little girl apart. Ray hoped that if he could just hold on long enough until help could arrive, they would both be okay. Ray did even better than that. By the time the rescuers arrived, Ray had pulled the little girl out of the water to safety. On April the 12th, 1989, Ray Blankenship was awarded the Coast Guard's Silver Life Saving Medal for this act. The award was fitting for Ray because not only did he risk his own life to save this little girl, his courage comes in the fact that Ray couldn't swim. Are there spiritual lessons that could be learned from Ray's selfless act in order to save a life? A man that was willing to jump into raging water, even though he couldn't swim. Well, I believe so. Today, our narrative will demonstrate the possibilities, even when we are reluctant, a little fearful and faithless. I'm using the title this morning. When God speaks those things that are not as though they are where they are. Well, when God speaks those things that are not as though they already were. If you have the Bibles, your devices, turn or swipe to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 1. Judges Chapter 6, starting at verse 1. 
I will be reading from the Holy Christian Standard Bible, Judges chapter 6, starting in verse 1. And if you're there, would you please respond by saying amen? Amen. amen. The Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. For the Lord handed them over to Midian seven years, and they oppressed Israel. Because of Midian, the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites, the Amalekites, the Ketamites came and attacked them. They encamped against them, destroyed the produce of the land, even as far as Gaza. They left nothing for Israel to eat, as well as no sheep, ox, or donkey. For the Midianites came with their cattle and their tents like a great swarm of locusts. They and their cattle were without number, and they entered the land to waste it. So Israel became poverty-stricken because of Midian, and the Israelites cried out to the Lord. It is the time of the judges. Judges were these religious judicial figures called by God to lead the people after the death of Joshua and all of the elders that outlived him. After Deborah and Barak delivered Israel from the oppression of the king of Canaan, Israel experienced 40 years of peace. But unfortunately, as you know about the history of the children of Israel, that peace would not last for long. Israel slid back into apostasy. And the Bible declares that God handed them over to Midian for seven years of chastisement. Midian's oppression of the children of Israel is severe. The Israelites are hiding in mountains and caves. And when, the, when they plant crops, the Midianites and the Malachites and the Canaanites and their cousins, the Ites, would just come and swoop in on the Israelites, destroy their crop, took their sheep, took their cattle, their donkeys, so they couldn't even plant. The Midianites are seeking to annihilate God's people from the face of the earth through violence and starvation. Facing starvation and total extinction, Israel cries out to God for deliverance. They knew that there was nothing they can do in their current situation. And it's been my experience in life that when you figure out that there's nothing you can do, God will have your undivided attention. And so they cry out to the Lord. Verse 7, same chapter. When the Israelites cried out to him, God, because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to them. Prophet said to them, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. I brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. I delivered you from the power of Egypt and the power of all who oppressed you. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites whose land you live in, but you did not obey me. Now, one would expect God to be sympathetic to the plight of his people, and I assure you that he is. But they needed to be admonished, admonished for the covenant that they were breaking and violating. So instead of God sending first a deliverer, hear me here, God decides to send a prophet. A prophet to call the people to repentance, to call people to reformation, to call the people back to serve the true and, to, and the living God. The prophet reminds them how much they have deviated from the will of God and the terms of the covenant that he established with them. But because the Lord is good and his mercy endured forever, God has a plan to liberate the children of Israel. 
He has a plan for his rebellious children. You see, the God that we serve, hallelujah, doesn't hold grudges like some of you do. Thank you, Lord. God will forgive. It's in his very nature to be forgiving. No matter how many times we turn our backs on God, no matter how many times we let him down, no matter how many times we see it in his face, we can come back to God each and every time. The Lord says if we simply confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And the Bible even declares that he takes our sins and he throws them in the sea of forgetfulness and then God then has to perform a miracle because God is all knowing he's omniscient so what God now has to do is perform a miracle on himself and cast that sin somewhere in the recesses of his mind that is in a lockbox of the mind of God where he cannot even access So God just puts it away. So after sending the prophet to remind them of the terms of the covenant and how they have transgressed the Lord, God now puts his plan to liberate his people into action. Now watch this now. Verse 11. What Sister Connie read for us today. The angel of the Lord came and he sat under the oak that was in Abora, which belonged to Joash, the Ibaz right. His son Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine vat in order to hide it from the Midianites. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Some of your translations say mighty man of valor. Yeah. Gideon said to him, please, sir, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened? And where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about? They said, hasn't the Lord brought us out of Egypt? Now, the Lord has abandoned us. Folks, the God of the universe comes down as the angel of the Lord under an oak tree and he sees Gideon and while Gideon is trying to thresh wheat in a wine vat he looks at him and says Gideon the Lord is with you you mighty warrior you mighty man of valor now, folks, um, you're going to find out about Gideon. And we're going to have to deal with this declaration that God makes at the very beginning. Because Gideon, in response, in experiencing this theophany of God, this manifestation of God's pleasant presence under the guise of the angel of the Lord, when Gideon hears the pronouncement, it's as if he's blaming God for what's going on. Where is the Lord with all this stuff happening to us as if God has separated himself from them as opposed to them separating themselves from God? God is not responsible for their predicament, but God is in the process of delivering them. God called Gideon to deliver Israel from the power of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and deliver Israel from the power of Midian. Am I not sending you? Get in, in your own strength. I'm going with you. Go and deliver Israel from Midian. Then here we come with the parade of excuses. Verse 15, he said to him, please, Lord, how can I deliver Israel? Look, my family is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's house. God responds, verse 16, but I will be with you, the Lord said to him. You will strike Midian down as if it were 
one man. God declares that not only am I sending you, but I'm going with you. And you're going to strike Midian down. That number that cannot be broken. They come in like a, a locust, swarm of locusts. But you're going to strike Midian down as if Midian is one man. What is Gideon's response to this bold declaration of God? Hearing God sending him, God saying, I'm going to be with you and I will tell you the outcome in advance. Gideon says, I need a sign. I, 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 I can't go until you give me a sign. I'm not sure about who I'm even talking to. I need some credentials. Can I see your identification that you are God? And the way you can demonstrate that is I need a sign. I need a sign. So, verse 17, he said to him, if I found favor in your sight, give me a sign that you, God, are speaking with me. Instead of simply believing and accepting the word of the Lord, Gideon needs a sign in order for God to identify himself that he is what he is. Lord, have mercy. So God tells Gideon, okay, go ahead. And Gideon brings food to be offered. And so he sets it all up. And, and the Lord causes a fire to come from under the rock to consume the sacrifice. And God disappears. And surely Gideon recognizes that he has been in the presence of the Lord. And so much so, the Bible says, he becomes even fearful. Verse 21, if you drop down, it says, the angel of the Lord extended the tip of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread. Fire came up from the rock, consumed the meat, the unleavened bread, and the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. Verse 22, when Gideon realized that he was the angel of the Lord, he said, oh no, Lord God, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Newsflash, Gideon, tell us what we don't already know. Yes, you were in the presence of God. Yes, God was calling you to deliver his people. And now you have your sign. You know it was the Lord. First assignment, go to your daddy's house and tear down the idol that he has to Baal and the Asherah pole. That's your first assignment. Go and tear it down. So God tells Gideon to start at his own house, folks. He didn't say go to the neighbors. <laughs> He didn't say go to your sister-in-law, your brother-in-law. He said start at your daddy's house where you got this uh, altar for Baal and an Asherah pole. Tear it down and build an altar to the Lord. You know, reform always begins at your house, not somebody else's house. So Gideon, start at your daddy's house. And I'm reluctant Gideon, instead of obeying God, decides that he would do it, but because of his fear and his reluctance, he now does it under the cloak of darkness. He gets 10 men because he's fearful. He says, I'm the youngest in the family and so forth. So he does what God tells him to do, but instead of doing it boldly in broad daylight, he does it in the dark. Folks, I submit to you, God doesn't do anything in the dark. God does it right out front. He wants the world to see. But Gideon goes, he tears that down. And, you know, dad is being persecuted by the people saying, hey, and watch this now. Gideon and his men do it in the dark. By daytime, they said, we know Gideon did this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, somebody was watching. Gideon tore this down. Bring him out. He tore down Baal's altar. We're going to deal with Gideon. And now his father is forced to defend Gideon against this false god of Baal that he had erected in, in front of his house. 
So he has to say, why are you arguing for Baal? If Baal needs to deal with this, then let Baal deal with this. Why you have to deal with this? And so, so the altar is torn down. The altar of God has been set up. But it's like almost on cue now. Midian, Amalek, Kedem, they join forces, and now they cross over into the Jordan in order to get ready to mount an attack against Israel. Some people would say, see, we tore down Baal's altar, and now the Midians are coming to get us. This is judgment. But now God has already promised now Gideon that Midian is going to be delivered into his hands. Um, but here we go again. Gideon says, um, if you want me to do this, I need to be sure. So I need another sign. Verse 33. All the Midianites, Amalekites, Ketamites, gathered together, crossed over the Jordan, camped in the valley of Jezreel. The Spirit of the Lord took control of Midian, Gideon, and he blew the ram's horn, and the Israelites rallied behind him. He sent messengers throughout all of Manasseh who rallied behind him. He sent messengers throughout Asher, Zebulun, and Nephilim who also came to meet him. And then Gideon said to God, If, my Lord, you will deliver Israel by my hand, as you said, do you understand the contradiction in that? He says, if you will do what you said you will do, I will put a fleece of wool here on the threshing floor. If dew is on the fleece and I'll, all the ground is dry, I will know you will deliver Israel by my strength as you see. So you do this and then I'll believe what you said. So I'm putting the fleece out. I will the fleece wet and this have all of the ground dry. God does it for him. There you go. Fleece wet, everything's dry. Gideon said, uh, God, don't be angry with me. Verse 39. Let me speak one more time. Please allow me to make one more test with the fleece. I, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't ask for the right test. You know, that's easy for you to, to make the fleece wet and, and the whole ground dry. And so I, I just need to be sure before I go out. So I, I'm going to reverse this because this is the one that I need you to do. I, I need the, I need the, the fleece to be dry, and I need all the ground to be wet. And that's, that's what I need you to do. Let, let the fleece remain dry and do be all over the ground. That night, the Bible says, verse 40, God did as Gideon requested. Only the fleece was dry and do was all over the ground. God does it for him. Gideon has his second sign. Now, Gideon with his newfound courage, he puts out the call and the warriors of God respond. The people of God send 32,000 troops to go to battle against Midian and it's all of its partners. It's about to go down. This is the one part in the jungle, but it's going to be over by the Jordan. But this time, I have a question to ask you before the battle begins. Because I want to know from you, have you ever asked yourself this question, why does Gideon keep asking for signs? Well, let me bring it closer to home. Why do you keep asking God for signs? Why did God Call Gideon, a mighty man of valor, when in actuality he behaves more like a coward. You see, Gideon and some of you keep asking for signs because you don't have the faith to believe God's word. God told Gideon exactly what his expectations were. 
God told Gideon exactly what Gideon should do. God told Gideon exactly what God would do. But God's word was not enough for Gideon. He needed a sign. And Gideon needed a sign because of his lack of faith. He didn't really believe God would do what God said he would do. But God also calls Gideon a mighty man of valor because God speaks those things that are not as though they already are. See, God sees where Gideon is right now in the stream of time. But see, God can step outside of the stream. He can look at the end from the beginning, and then he can declare, Gideon, you're not there right now. But if you continue on the path that I have you for, you will be what I just declared you to be, even though you are not. God speaks those things that are not as though they all really were. So Gideon will be a mighty man of valor, but he is not yet. Now watch this now. God knows this. So look at what God does. We now dovetail into Judges chapter 7. And we know the story. 32,000 soldiers have shown up. They're ready to go to battle. And God has the nerve to say to this reluctant deliverer, you know what, Gideon? That's too many. 32,000. You can see, if, if you go to battle and you guys win, you don't think you won because of your strategy, because of your valor and your bravery, and then you guys will think you delivered yourselves. So, so that's too many. So Gideon, tell anybody that is fearful, you can just go home. You can just leave. Go back to your families in the field. And so. Gideon makes the call, hey, anybody fearful, you go back home. No, no harm, no foul. Go right back home. And so, for real? Yeah, yeah, you can go. You can just go back home, no issues, no problems. We, we can just leave? Yes, if you're scared. Now, if you're ready for the battle, you can stay here. But if you're scared, you can go. Uh, all right, well, this is, that's, I'm, I'm going. 22,000. More than two thirds of the total number of his army bounce, folks. We out of here. See you. Let us know how it all goes while they're walking away. Gideon's got 10,000. However, he's got 10,000 folks who are not afraid to go to battle. So Gideon's got something to work with. So Gideon's still good. These 10,000 are not afraid. So they're ready to go to battle. We're going to talk with Gideon today. And the Lord says, Ah, not Gideon. But Lord, you still got two men. Two thirds just left, Lord. Yeah, 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 but the 10,000. Yeah, you guys would be too, too bold on that. Um, you might think that you're because you got 10,000 warriors. Um, so we need to let some more folks go. So I'm going to give a test. I'm going to give a test. You know, you like to give me tests. <laughs> what? I'm going to give you a test to watch this. So, so I'll tell you who's going to stay. So they get to some water, and they, they must have been thirsty. No, the cotton, they might have been a little parched. And so they get to the water, and they get down. Some get down like a dog and start looking in the water. Some pull the water up to their hand, and they drink the water from their hand. And God says, get him, get him. How many of those folks kind of put their face down and lap the water like a dog? When Gideon does a number count, oh. And we lost 300. It was 9,700, Lord. 9,700. And the ones who are licking the water out of their hands, oh, 300. It was just 300 of them. Okay. Yeah, that works. That works. Now, the 9,000 said, no, not the 9,000. Send them all. The 300, Gideon. The 300. Now, you already know. 
Gideon has a problem with this. Three hundred Lord? Well, you going to deliver me? I, I could have took the 9,700 more. That's all we going three. That's all I need. That's all I need. This is good. This is good. We got this, Gideon. We got this. So tomorrow, we're going to deal with this thing. Well, you know, Gideon couldn't sleep well that night. It's hard being fearful. He's worried about the outcome. And he's not as mighty a man of valor as God declared him to be in the beginning. But the good news is this, watch this. God knows. God knows what he's dealing with, folks. He knows what he's dealing with with Gideon. He knows what he's dealing with with each one of us. And so watch this now. We're in Judges chapter 7, verse 9. Watch this. That night, God said to him, Get up, go into the camp. Why well, I've given it into your hand. Well, if you are afraid, hint, hint, go to the camp. Go with Korah, your servant. Listen to what they say, and then you will be strengthened to go to the camp. So get him, get to Korah, because he's afraid. And they go to the camp that he's supposed to fight against. They are like a swarm, a number that cannot even be numbered. And he's got 300. And Gideon goes there and he listens in on a conversation. Now folks, this is going to blow you away because it tells us in verse 12 the Midianites, the Malachites, and the Kedemites had settled down in the valley like a swarm of locusts. Their camels, we're not talking about the soldiers, their camels were innumerable as the sand on the seashore. The camels. The camels are not going to be doing the fighting boats. The camels are innumerable. But then when Gideon arrives, there's a man telling his friend, about a dream he had. He said, listen, I had a dream. A loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midian camp and struck a tent and it fell. And you have to know barley was to be consumed usually by animals. If humans are eating barley, it's because they're real poor. So this wheat, this barley of wheat coming in doesn't speak highly of the barley bread itself. But he says it struck the tent and it fell. The loaf turned the tent upside down so that it collapsed. His friends answered, this is nothing less than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, the Israelite. God has handed the entire meeting camp over to him. Folks, God gives a prophetic dream to a pagan enemy of God to encourage his mighty man of valor in battle. This is what God has to do to get Gideon to be what he declared for him that he already was, but he was not yet. So God doesn't even trust giving the dream to Gideon because Gideon will say, but I need a sign. So God says, I'm giving the dream to somebody else. And notice, the dream to the foreign soldier is, this is the sword of Gideon, and God is getting ready to deliver the camp to, me, to, to Gideon. He don't need a sign. He ain't even serving the true and living God. God can't even trust giving the sign to Gideon. So he gives it to somebody else so Gideon can listen in and be encouraged. Well, folks, we look at this story, we know they win the battle, and we know that in the end, in the end, Gideon does become. He does become that mighty 
man of valor that God declared him at the very end. But it's important to note Gideon's reluctance. Even when God himself told Gideon what he would do, how God wanted to use Gideon, Gideon struggled with that even in his own faith. He couldn't believe that God could use someone like him to accomplish something so great. And there are many of us who have a Gideon spirit. God wants to do some things in you you can't even begin to plant them or even imagine. But it's not about you. It's about what God can do to you. And you simply make yourself available. And just allow God to do what God said he would do. When I was studying for this message, I said, wow, you know, there's so many lessons and applications to make in this. The first thing is, it just jumps out at you is, God doesn't need a whole lot of people to accomplish his purpose. He don't need 32,000. He don't need 10,000. He just needs a Gideon group. And Gideon's done 300. That's all he needs. That's less than a tenth of the folks he had with them. But God is looking for commitment. That's all. This is looking for people who are committed. People who are willing to do what God says for them to do. So that was the first lesson as I'm studying is that God doesn't need a whole bunch of people. It just needs committed people. He needs pretty much in that are willing to do whatever God says do. Not the 22,000 that were scared, not the 10,000 that didn't seem to uh, be vigilant in what they ought to be doing. They're preparing to go to battle and they got their heads down, and they can come in right from behind them. They're not even ready. It's only 300 that are in a steady state of readiness. So God doesn't need a whole lot of people, He just needs committed people, He needs committed people. And at the end of the day, all of this was not about him. It was about God delivering his people. And God will use any old thing, any old person to accomplish his will. And we are available and allow ourselves to be used. When Moses was on the back side of the mountain, he would worship him too. And in this instance, God sees Gideon. He says, yeah, I can use Gideon. We used Gideon because Gideon was not prideful. Gideon didn't think highly of himself. And God says, I can use this. Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, God's strength is made perfect in weakness. That your weakness serves as a platform for God himself to stand upon. You simply become the pedestal of God as he stands on your weakness. Now, God needs that weakness, but he doesn't need your reluctance. He doesn't need your lack of faith because his weakness serves as a vehicle for him to do great things through you. So that he and he alone we receive all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. I want you to reflect on this story in the coming week. Because tonight, our large committee will be meeting, and our large committee will be meeting to select the nominating committee, which we will be bringing to you next week.
จุบันพอนแอนแอนเชื่อว่าเป็นทุกข์นามในคมเมรีส์บางทีและบางทีและบางทีเราไปเจอมากขึ้นกว่าคนอื่นอันนี้เราพยายามทำทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอย่างทุกอFill the ministries that we can, and I will receive that as a sign that God says these are the priorities for right now. These are the positions you can man. These are the positions that we will accomplish great things to. I'm not going to be asking people to fill two and three and four positions, and then they get burned out. Who is going to replace them? The ones who say no in the time we call. So we're going to fill the positions based on those priorities that we've had in our mission and vision statement, and those those positions will be filled, and we are going to work by the union. Committed people, sold out for Jesus, and I'm not concerned about the number. And if we need more. I will simply pray for the Lord of the Harvest to send for the laborers. But we are going to work with the Union Group, and in 2022, we are going to accomplish great and marvelous things because God used us to His name's glory and honor. And we're going to look back at the end of 22, and we're going to declare, "What has God wrought?" With a small number of people, we are going to turn this community upside down. Not because of us. It's because of what God is going to do through us and for us. Through us and for us. So I want you to think about this. When we call you, folks, we prayed. And prayed and prayed some more. We don't take names out of a hat and say, "Hey, this this name came out. What position we gonna offer them?" We're praying. We're asking for God's guidance. We're asking for the Holy Spirit to lead us. And when we call your name, it's because that's who God has led us to. You don't need a sign. Sure, you can pray. We encourage you to pray. We've been praying too. And sometimes God will ask you to do things that maybe you say, "Well, I don't necessarily have the skills or the gifts or the abilities for this." We don't need that. We need the willingness. God will provide you with what you need. We just need a yes. We know what we're doing. We're praying, asking for God to lead us to people. We see names and we say, "Well, okay, this is what the Lord would have us to do." So we do that. Sometimes we are surprised. We call you as you are. We're just following the Lord. We're not putting God in a box, telling God what He can and can't do, who He can choose and who He can't choose. He's sovereign. We're not advising God. He's guiding us. So when we call you, it's not a frivolous matter. We are on God's errand. We are on God's assignment to tell you God is looking for a few good men and women. And all we need from you is yes. So, so, so I pray that the story about Gideon. You see that God calls those things that are not. As though they already were, and when we call you, when we pray, we pray, we petition the Lord, and God laid your name on collectively our minds. We 
Remember the guarantees. It's not one person that gets to decide. So just know there's a consensus when we call in. It's not a plan to get prepared because we're going to have our team in place no later than September. And by the end of September, our team is in place. We're going to train everybody. We're going to train. We'll start our training program. We're going to have our mentoring program in place. We're going to get everything ready so come January the 1, we're going to get it. And everything we're going to do is going to be preparing for our evangelism and baptisms that we'll be planning. You know, it's not going to happen overnight. My wife didn't get pregnant overnight. Well, so I say, well, she got pregnant overnight. She didn't get pregnant overnight. Oh, I said, oh, yeah. Because I remember when I, I, I talked to you about it, I remember the night, though. I remember the night. But she didn't get, she didn't get pregnant and have a baby. I remember that night. I remember She didn't get, she didn't have a baby in the night. It took nine months for the baby to come forward. <laughs> we did nine months. So our evangelistic plan is a nine-month plan. It's a nine-month intentional plan to bring forward new things in Jesus Christ. It's not a quick fix. This is a nine-month plan. So we're going to have everybody positioned. So January, we're going to put our plan into progress. So that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be inviting all the people to be a part of that. God is going to do some great things because we have to restore the years that the neighbors have eaten. We've got to gain that territory that has been lost from God. And in the name of Jesus, we're taking it back. We're taking it good. We're taking it back. So let's go stand. We're going to have a little prayer. We're going to quickly transition, Isaac and I, and we'll be back out here. Brother Cotton will lead us out into some songs, and then we're going to have our baptism, and then you're going to be dismissed. Father, in the name of Jesus. Thank you for gifts and kingdom. You didn't use the sharpest knife in the drawer. The most gifted and talented person in Israel. You moved Gideon, reluctant, doubtful, lacking in faith. You chose him. You declared he was a mighty man of valor, even though he wasn't. And you used him to deliver your people. And I'm so glad. But because you are not a respecter of persons, you use each and every one of us. Thank you, Lord, because you use angels that would do it right the first time, every time. But you choose to cooperate with evil men and women to accomplish your purposes here on earth. Thank you for the honor and privilege of being co-laborers with you. Give us the courage. Give us the discernment to hear your voice. And by God's grace, may we make ourselves available to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Let the church say amen. And the I no, I've been changed. I know I've been changed. The angels in the heaven don't find my name. Oh, I, 
blow out in the tank. Thank <laughs> you. 
we have with us Isaac Troutman. We've been knowing him for a long time, since he's a little kid. And we're grateful that his mom has flown in for this very special occasion. Isaac was telling me that God's been speaking to him in dreams. And he has no idea what God is planning to do. But all I can tell him is based on the word of God, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plan. Yes. I have for you plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. Max, come around so you can hear my focus. You can be up front. So, God's got a special work for you to do. Isaac contacted me and said, say, Dad, Pastor, I, I need to get rebaptized. I want to recommit my life to the Lord. I want to be used by the Lord. One of the easiest baptisms I've ever done. He called me, Elder Hudson. I didn't call him. And he said that the Lord impressed him that this was the step that he needed to take so that God could use him in a very special way. So Isaac, because of your love for Jesus, your desire to commit yourself to him, it is a privilege and honor for me to baptize you today in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, be faithful unto death. back to normal and just want to let you know that as we're getting back to normal we're planning to have another baptism next month so if you're interested and you want to be a part of that you just contact me we will give you your bible studies where you can study because we want you to know what you're saying yes to and so we'll make sure that you're study you understand the fundamental beliefs of the church god's expectations for you within the body of christ god doesn't ask for you to come perfect he just says come as you are understand what you're agreeing to and then we will be sure to disciple you and to prepare you and to use you for god's glory and honor so this will serve as our benediction um, we're going to get dressed and we'll step out, uh, come back out. For those of you who stay back, we'll extend to Isaac, the right hand of fellowship. Um, those who don't get it today, we'll do it again officially next week. But if you'll please stand, we'll have our benediction. We thank you so much for staying back. We thank our YouTube family for joining us and Zoom for being a part of this as well. We just went off with a benediction and thank God for what he's done for us today. Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, the word of God says there's joy in heaven. Only one sinner that repents. 
We seek to join in with the party that is going on in glory right now. We thank you for touching Isaac's heart, having him to make this decision. Now, Lord, order his steps in your word. Let not any iniquity have dominion over him. Use him to your name's glory and honor. And may he look forward to the benediction. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. So God, as we prepare to leave this place, but never from your presence, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace this day, both now and forever. In Jesus' name, let the saints of God say amen, amen, and amen. God bless you.